very much for coming. The cool title of this talk is The Similarity Between Serverless, Porsche, and Closure. The boring title is the Building the uh, Smart Radio and the Recommender System Using Closure and the Serverless Architecture. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about the challenge, the business domain that we are in, soft introduction, very quick introduction to the projects, and then talk about the technical architecture, what, where Amazon shines, actually, and dive a bit into the serverless architecture, and then lessons learned, and what is in the future. In this talk, we are not definitely going to talk about MongoDB, uh, object-oriented programming, Microsoft, Oracle, all the things. Thank you. <laughs> the goal of uh, mine is for you to try tomorrow a, a running a lambda function and then after that to write a step function to be able to just a complete very simple task and at the end of the day if you want to have a availability from the outside world maybe you will connect it to the API gateway to see the whole flow working. Before we begin, uh, fd.nl, it's where the projects are uh, done. It's the, the, the company that uh, I've been working for. It's called the Financial Dagblad. Uh, it's the Financial Times of the Netherlands. They don't have any relationship directly. Uh, FD also owns the BNR radio. And then the two projects that I am talking about today is one is the smart radio. The other one is the smart journalism. So smart radio is about the, the live radio and then how we basically present the live radio back to the users using a mobile application. And the journalism is about recommendations. We started as uh, three data scientists, myself as a data engineer, a product owner, uh, a product owner and a business owner. Now we are actually around uh, five data scientists and four interns working for us. We are a special group within the FD. Uh, we are funded by Google DNI projects, Digital News Initiative. So Google had this big fine, and they want to, you know, kind of go back to the community and uh, work out with the publishers. So they cr created this nice fund. They have been recently did the round six, and it's ongoing. So if you have really nice ideas about the uh, uh, news and the digitalization, apply that. Whoever we talk with our customers, they keep on saying the same thing. They want to on demand personalized content because they, they see, constantly see like irrelevant things on the websites. <coughs> and we would like to understand what they want without explicitly asking them, but try to implicitly understand what do they need. And in order to do that, we use our existing audio and text content to basically ship them in a different way, but make it very personalized and relevant. The biggest challenge, I think, not only for the customers, but for ourselves as programmers or developers, that we are so easily distracted. Like there are always new features, new features that are coming through the business. There are always problems that we have to deal with, infrastructure problems or coding problems that we are even in themselves, uh, ourselves, is distracted all the time. And we don't want to work on the infrastructure all the time. We want to actually focus on building the functionality of the business. So our idea was to uh, use as many as managed services of AWS and try to focus on the uh, features. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, be cost effective and make a transparent system. Also, since we have a, quite a bit of a large uh, community on the, the website and also the BNR application, we have to easily scale up and down. So this was quite a bit, a bit also problematic, as you can imagine. And we are not a big team, so we have limited human resources as well. BNR Smart Radio, at the end of the day, it lets you choose tags that you are interested in. And from there on, you basically get the relevant audio from the live stream. It is not complicated. There is not a huge innovation. But what we do is we basically take the one audio live audio uh, radio stream, chop it into smaller segments, 
tag these and then put it to your stream. So you can basically listen to these four or five minutes uh, streams of audio that are related to whatever you, you would like to hear. So in this, in this context, it's Banken or uh, working uh, mark or Bitcoin. Recommendation system is a very similar product, but in a different domain, of course, that we kind of uh, take a look at what you are watching, in our case, what you are reading, and then basically try to find the similar articles and then recommend to you. Before I started this project, I have been working on closure, bit closure, around five years. So mainly most of this work is done in the distributed systems. I have even uh, <coughs> coded myself some system that handled 10,000 requests per second. So this was quite a bit eye-opener for me to be able to handle these, these many requests in closure because, I mean, there are a lot of things that people say, hey, you know, it's not as fast as Java, it's not as fast as Go. Well, if you can handle these amount of requests and more, what do you need more? Like, are you talking about really one nanosecond? Do we really need that fast? I don't think so. We don't need it all the time. And closure is really good with the parallelism as well. And when you look at the simplicity of the, what we are having an input and an output, closure shines. And it is very good with talking all the other systems. So before I get into this project, once I started to talk with the, uh, during the interview, uh, what the project required, I did see Closure is a perfect fit. So I did able to uh, convince the business owners that, okay, if I'm gonna work on this project, I'm gonna write this in Closure because otherwise I'm not gonna be part of it. And that was a good agreement at the beginning because we started from there on. And the nice thing is, of course, this was a greenfield project. And the evolution of the project did not happen from the first day. So it happened throughout the time. I mean, my intention wasn't build the greatest Lambda architecture or serverless architecture. My idea was to start with the closure and see what happens. And throughout the time, we did able to see the, the nice combination of uh, Lambda and uh, serverless architecture in our project. So as I mentioned, we take the one audio of the live radio, we remove the uh, advertisements out of the audio and then we basically tag all these pieces and ship them back to the uh, customers. The uh, technologies that we use, it's, I think if you're in the Amazon, you are also using most of these technologies like S3, RDS, API, Gate, API Gateway is a new one for me as well, Step Functions, Lambda Functions, Kinesis for, or Kafka, depends on what you want. Uh, cloud formation was also a very good point for us because it let the infrastructure automa automation as much as possible. And we even use elastic transcoding to transcode our audio from WAV to MP3s. And uh, in order to ship our Docker containers, we use the Elastic Container Service in AWS. In a nutshell, Smart radio, we have mobile clients here. They send their request to us. To, it's a basically a list of tags that they are interested in. We handle the request, we take a look at our database, and then we find the related audio fragments and send the customers back. That's it. And our workflow, in theory, that we take the valve and then convert it to the MP3, it's called transcoding. Then we take this audio and then convert into text. So it's transcribing. Transcribing is done via a third party. So we don't have a control on this process. We just wait for an answer. And then we find the red segments, we predict their tags, what is this text is about, and then store these tags in the database in RDS. But in practice, of course, we have more complication because we don't know exactly when transcoding is going to uh, finish. Or the same with the transcription process. It takes around 15 minutes to transcribe an hour data. So we have to, our system needs to be working. But 
when you put these all into consideration, that uh, it came to mind that you know when we are running our servers at this time, we are just wasting our time and resources because we don't need to do anything. But you don't want to probably start and stop your services every 15 minutes. So this created this nice notion of, okay, can we use a workflow system for us? And I think step function was a really nice uh, solution to this problem. If we go back to the, the journalism project and the recommendation system, we decided, our data scientists decided that uh, we need a content-based system because it's a good solution for the cold start problem of the new users and uh, also include the transparency and the sparsity. We used similar technologies, but we add two more into the uh, project, actually three. One is the SQS, the other one is DynamoDB and Redshift. Before going further, let me ask you, how many of you ever use Lambda function in production? Can you raise your hands? Okay, maybe 15%. <laughs> step functions, how about step functions? Anybody here? Two, three, okay. Well, we have a start, but uh, we just need to, I think, try more as an industry to, to take a look at what is available in the solutions. I found this nice graph graphics to describe what the Lambda does or what are the, the, the good points of Lambda. It integrates very well with the rest of the AWS work. It is quite easy to set up. There are a lot of programming languages with the latest, I think, updates. You can almost use anything right now. You pay what you need. Like if your system doesn't run it, you are paying nothing. And that's the whole code that we needed to implement to integrate or to make a closure, uh, uh, make it running in uh, JVM in a Lambda function. This is it. Like basically, you pass a function. This function is wrapped around the handle request method, which is basically in a generated class. And this is what you pass in the Lambda settings that this is my class, please call it when you need to call the uh, Lambda. The serverless, or it's also used functions as a service interchangeably, that I think paper use the updates, you can individually update Lambda functions. So in a normal application, when you are running, you normally deploy that is the, the latest version of the code, everything, right? If you have a monotonic application, you might change one line of code, but you are basically changing all of your application. If you have microservices, you are a bit more luckier, but you still need to deal with the microservices. But when you look at the, the functions or the Lambda functions, you can basically can change the minimum amount of code in your running system so that you have actually less dependency or less effect on the overall system. One of the nice benefits of using Lambda is that you can basically put in a VPC, you can set all the security groups, in, groups individually. It's quite nice features and also pick any language. Let's say you are running a Lambda function in Python and you realize it's not running as fast as you want. So you can basically swap your existing Lambda that is written in Python with a uh, .NET or Go, that the caller will never have any idea what language you are using behind the scenes, but then you can basically swap whatever is running. In step functions, you have very simple amount of components that you can use. One is a task. Task is mainly calling a Lambda function that is already in your system. And in any task, you can implement auto retry and catch mechanisms. So you can say, okay, try this Lambda three times. If it fails, it goes once in a second. And you can also uh, set up the, the back off strategy, so to give some seconds behind. You can implement simple if conditions that, for example, in this scenario, I think select image container is a condition. So maybe like check the file extension here. If it's a PNG, call this method. Otherwise, call the JPEG function. 
and you can also operate them in parallel. So in theory, you can load the database and unsupported times. Well, it doesn't make sense, but maybe these two, you can run them in parallel. So the, if there is an execution next to it, that it will wait both of these operations to finish, like a normal PMAP. And that this is how you define a step function in AWS. That you have a here task, it's hard to see, but it is where your lambda function definition is. And then you have catch methods. And then once one of the conditions are hit, it basically goes to this step that is specified here. IP, API gateway is also very handy to use to basically put it in front of your uh, services or uh, functions. For example, in our case, the BNR radio, we have an API gateway that handles all the mobile incoming API requests. So we can easily configure the, the API gateway to have as this many as requests, and if it goes over it, it will it should throttle. So will do nice things for you, rather than crashing your system completely. It also supports canary releases. You can implement custom authorization <laughs> mechanisms, but out of the box, it also have a nice uh, API keys and uh, the, 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 the buckets that you can put these API keys, so like uh, different packages that uh, if you have like customers that has different amount of limits that you wanna limit them. You can create the API keys within these buckets and then give them these specific things. So you don't need to program all these things by yourself. In our system, we have, uh, in the recommendation system, we have these four big components that uh, we have to deal with. One is the collection part. Collection meaning handling all the user events on the website. Representation is representing our users and articles in a numeric, numerical form. Event handling is where we receive article updates and all the other events that are happening, important events happening in our systems. And as you know, in normal machine learning, we have the train and the predict parts. So for collection, we again have an API gateway and behind that there's a Lambda function and each of these incoming events are put into the Kinesis, which is a Kafka uh, or event stream, as you know. And these are written into DynamoDB. So DynamoDB our, is a kind of our short-term event storage. At the same time, the Kinesis automatically forwarded or ingested by the Kinesis Firehose. And the Kinesis Firehose job led us to write all of the incoming requests, uh, currently set up as two minutes or 10,000 messages as a S3 bucket. So if we lose these DynamoDB or Redshift database, no matter what happens, we can always go back. <laughs> that you may also think in Lambda architecture terms that this is our ground truth. Like whatever happens in the system, we can always run, replay our events from the Amazon S3. And the other job of the Kinesis firewalls is forward all of our events into Redshift. So Redshift is our infinite storage. So we can always take a look at the behavior or the, or the visits of any user or any customer, which we then use uh, when we are representing the users and articles. <coughs> In order to represent users and articles, we needed to consume multiple machine learning systems to give them a representation. Content Monkey, it basically receives a text file and then do an analysis of it, such as tokenization, sentiment analysis, post tagging, semantic linking. All these informations are come together. Tagger also uses this information, the tag uh, specific already existing tags in our system, so to match them. Entity linker, for example, if there is ABN M Embro text exists, or Google or Microsoft, we already have a database that contains all these entities that we have a link that we know for a fact that 
this is the related item or if it's an apple as a fruit or apple as a company so that we can figure out all the differences. The other part is the feature extraction. So feature extraction uses these representations and give us back the numerical form. So whatever we are passing in, we are gonna get an array of floating numbers because this is how the training system is going to work. Also sampler that let's say if a, if a user viewed one article and did not view 35 items, we don't wanna use both all the positives, all the negatives, but we're gonna take a sample, for example, from the negatives so that we have a balanced training or learning session. And the trainer basically ingests all the features from all of our representations. All of the systems here are run in Python. They are in containers and we are making HTTP requests using Lambda. So when the all processing throughout the offline job happens, our closure code is the controller logic. So whatever needs to be done, it figures out, okay, I am missing the content representation of this. So it calls the content. And once it finds the answer for this content, it stores it to DynamoDB. Because when you are comparing the, the time that is needed to compute, for one article right now, it takes around one second to compute the, the content monkey representation. Whereas if I make this request once, store it to DynamoDB, it takes around two milliseconds. So in a context where we have more than 30,000 users in a single day, all these seconds matter a lot because we have a, in the middle of the night when we start our jobs, we have around four or five hours to complete the task. And as these numbers increase, it takes longer and longer. And all the Python code that we are running in the, the ECS is controlled by the Fargate. So Fargate is also the automatic controlling mechanism of rather than having Docker, uh, sorry, Kubernetes, AWS has also the Fargate system. Now they're also supporting EKS. We may or may not transition to it, but so far we've been quite happy that we can easily scale from one machine to 50 machine and go back when we don't need it. Another flow that we have to deal with is that whenever an article is updated, we have to recompute all the representation of this article. So we have to delete all the existing records and then create them again and then use this for the rest of the system. When we started the project, that initial idea was that, okay, we have like a lot of data, a lot of visitors that we need, we need to deal with. And before installing Hadoop, I had this idea that, okay, we are writing code in Clojure. And what we need to do is we need to read the text file that all of the events are happening. And we need to group them by the user and then filter them out. Do we really need Hadoop? That was the first question. Then the second question was, like, do we have actually that much data? Can I store this data in my laptop? If the answer is yes, then I probably don't need Hadoop. And this was a quite a bit of a, uh, I think I have stopped writing code and think about this problem for three days before <laughs> doing anything. Because I know from that moment on, once I install Hadoop, I need to deal with the Hadoop. Right? And I will, need, I will need to pay for it not only deal with it, but also pay for it. And God knows what kind of a library mismatch and things are going to happen that I need to rerun things after waiting three days. I've been to this road and it's not fun. And it's, it's, it reminded me more infrastructure rather than building features. So I took the hard road and wrote around 150 or 200 lines of code to solve the same problem. So at the end of the day, if you look at the code, you may say, hmm, maybe you should have used Hadoop. That's an idea, but at the same time, it's a readable, slightly readable, closure code that everybody may understand without looking at Hadoop. So before starting your next project, when you think about, oh, we are gonna really do a big data project, please ask yourself whether can you do everything in your laptop? If the answer is yes, you probably don't have a big data problem. One of the benefits of running everything in Lambda was it's nice, like we can do a lot of stuff, we can deploy stuff, 
anytime we want, but how about the configuration? What are we gonna do about it? Like, and we're gonna ship the configuration with every file, because when you think about it, there are like tens of instances of your Lambda running that you have to change. Behind the scenes, there is this hidden service called Parameter Store, which is in the system manager of AWS. So if you are using AWS, please take a look, because if you need simple configuration, you can store all of this information in this service. It is not high throughput service, so if you send a lot of requests, they will say, nah, sorry, you can't do that. So try to cache them. For error management, we use Sentry. I think it's the best tool in the market. FP has me personally, I use it with uh, multiple languages. And Datadoc and CloudWatch is the, the monitoring and the for metrics. Uh, cloud formation for the infrastructure automation. And these two tools, I think, save a lot of inf infrastructure automation time for me. What they do is, rather than you writing these horrible template files, you basically define them programmatically in Stucker and Troposphere. These are Python-based projects. Please take a look at it before also jumping into Ansible or Terraform because this may also get a lot of stuff done for you. And for the scheduling jobs, we are using the Cloud, CloudWatch rules. This is the interesting part. Like Amazon has this like service architecture there, uh, kind of for like explaining all these nice things, but you end up with the same problems. Like, okay, where am I gonna store my configuration? How am I gonna sch schedule my jobs? And then you find these like uh, in the middle of nowhere links to do stuff. For example, if you look at the cloud, if you go to CloudWatch, you will see the small link on the left, it says the rules, that you can actually do scheduled tasks to call any Lambda function that you have. So an idea could be if you are gonna start your offline job at 12 a.m. in the middle of the night, you can basically write a small Lambda function to call your step function to start it off. But at the same time, what we are also going to do is we can also say, okay, increase the container sizes. Like, start these services to let our system ready for the whole operation. And whenever we are done, we can also put the same rules back. Okay, four hours later, please shut everything down. <coughs> if you look at our offline operation in the, the recommendation service that we have to first take a look at whether all of our content is ready. So we have somewhere around like a thousand articles published that day, and before, before we operating on them, we have to make sure that their representation is ready for all of the consumption next. And once we are uh, sure that the representation is ready, then we basically go over all the users that are available in the system, group their, uh, op uh, group their page views, and then make the representation. Because at the end of the day, what we are doing is we take a user representation and we take an article representation. And then this user has multiple articles that are viewed and multiple articles that are not viewed. So we have to make a meaning out of this. So if there is like a one positive and 40 negatives, we sample some, we end up with one versus 24 and we try to make a meaning out of this. So as you can imagine for 30,000 users, times 30 articles, there is a lot of representation to be fetched. And that's also one of the reasons why we use DynamoDB to quickly fetch them, rather than go back to the traditional database to ask for what it is, or basically call the HTTP service itself. All right, well, this story is not about <laughs> closure, slightly. So I have spoken early about this. A year ago, I said, you know, how cool it is. Boeing 737 MAX, an airplane, is actually using closure, both up in the air and also on the ground. So apparently they have implemented uh, some kind of a monitoring and alerting system on, uh, on top of the existing, uh, all uh, the metrics that are collected in the airplane. And before the guys started the project, they asked Boeing, hey, can we use Clojure? And they look at, yeah, it's JVM based, you can. 
and they implemented this nice project. But fast forward one year, that you know what happened lately. There were like a two aircraft crashes in the within a six months period. When the investigators looked at what the problem is, all they end up with the same system that Boeing implemented for 737 MAX. It's called MCAS. So MCAS, what it does is that it has a, the airplane has two angle of attacks readers in the, in the front side of the nose to basically calculate what is the angle of the airplane. And then it basically uses this information to rather help the pilot to uh, remove the plane out of a stall. So this is the whole idea. They wrote all the software, which is really nice. But what they decided to implement, rather than using both of the sensors, they decided to use only one sensor. I do. Which is crazy, right? <laughs> the first thing what they do is that in order to show the pilots a notification that these readings are inconsistent, they put them as an option, which that option cost $80,000 for this. And you know what's the worst part? This is the two crash that happens. If these were haven't happened, United Airlines has the same non-option. And then there's like 80 more planes coming in. And who knows what could have been happened before if these weren't uh, happened. Like, it is such a non-Boeing way. Like, Boeing is a normally a very manual building, a very manual airplanes, whereas Airbus is much more electrical. Like, it, uh, Airbus has this uh, stick that you have to control, and then there's all electric systems that controls the hydraulic systems, whereas Boeing is still very much old school. But then, because they change the airplane, they change where the motor is sitting, then they come up with a different stall recovery procedures. Then they said, okay, you know what? We will help the pilots. We are gonna build the system to help the pilots. <laughs> they built the system actually caused the airplane to crash twice, which is a quite a bit of a horrible story. So at the end of the day, reliability should not be an option. Like we have to build more reliable systems. And please think about it. I think Lambda architecture in general event-based systems, and also a lambda functions and the step functions help us to build more reliable systems. And be bold. I mean, when I started the project, okay, I, I was know that I was going to write in closure, but I was never aware of lambda functions or step functions. But the more I investigated them, the more I tried them, I, I see the tunnel that say, oh, you know, maybe I can actually write this whole system in Lambda function. So we started with smaller project, BNR was much more smaller compared to the, the recommendation system. So BNR was our test run and it succeeded. And then we take the same learnings and apply it to a bigger project. Our content monkey actually has a memory leak that we still couldn't figure out what is it. We are using open source tool. There might be some, but we are not aware of it. But the beauty of using the container service and everything involved that automatically takes a look at the states of the whole requests that are coming in, if there is enough room, it will not start a new service. But if that's the case, it will start a new. So although one of our servers just running out of memory and the Docker stops the machine, we still be able to operate without knowing what's going on. Of course, we have to solve the memory leak but still, I think this is a good reliability option that we have in the whole architecture. Try to aim for smaller functions. The smaller you can write these functions, the easier to put them in the Lambda functions. But it's also, at the same time, it's easier to update this running code. We had this in Python side. We were writing a more monolithic application. But then on the way, we decided to chop them in a smaller and smaller and smaller pieces because it's the same idea with the Lambda functions. You chop your functionality into smaller and smaller pieces. We did exactly the same. At some point, the feature extractor is running with 50 instances of some in total 200, uh, 100 gigabyte of RAM. 
whereas the sampler is only running with a single instance. And then we can individually change the code of these. Constraints are good. We started the project with not enough manpower, no DevOps guy. I was the only guy that I needed to do the project. So although I may do some shortcuts, I also needed to think more and more to how to operate a business in this sense, in the services, in the software. Otherwise, I mean, if a server, if a service needs all the time uh, some maintenance, then I'm not gonna able to write functionality. I'm gonna deal with the infrastructure. So for example, and, uh, the, the Tagger model that we started with, it was initially 22 gigabytes. And I said, it's impossible to put on a container it's impossible to run it in a Lambda function. So can we work on this? So thanks to our data scientists, they work on it for two weeks. And then they, they come up with a 538 megabyte of a model file. And their F1 score, this is their magic score, increased. So this was a win-win situation. So constraints are good sometimes. But trust and building a project, trust between team members, Becoming a team is even more important whatever the tools you are using, right? You may have the best tools, Closure, Serverless, Lambda, but still, it doesn't, things doesn't happen without making a team. Writing RFCs, request for comment or change, I think it's a game changer, and we don't write enough. We are always building our solutions, maybe write a bit of documentation and we are shipping it. But you cannot go back. You don't know how did you make up your mind? What were the options? Like you have no traceability on your idea process or thinking process. Maybe there are some notes. Maybe there are like a whiteboard discussions, but once a month is passed by, you will know, you will have no recollection of what went during that process you will not hear the business owner complaining about stuff, which influence your decision. So please try to write RFCs before it and use this structure or whatever structure you want to use to say, describe the problem and write down the details in the analysis part and write the options of your solutions. Because if you have only one option, I don't think you understand the problem very well. So, Take your time to describe and find out more options. And also get feedback from other people. Let them join the process and don't do this one-to-one. -one. Do this asynchronously. Let them take their time, read it, maybe come up with other options, but come back to you. Teach closure. Currently, all of our data scientists actually know how to write and read basic closure. I mean, smart people tend to learn fast, and it's always fun to learn another language. So rather than selling the whole closure to the business, try to sell the closure to your colleagues. Help them as much as you can, because you are gonna win at the end of the day, and the guy next to you maybe learn a new language, and he may really like it, even more like it than you are, and then take it to the next level, and maybe help with the end rebel as well, right? You never know. Don't DDoS your own systems. We built the BNR radio. There was a small, not bug, but they just keep on requesting the, uh, our service when they open it. There was no value. And these were the requests that we needed to handle. So this was a quite nice test about Lambda uh, functions. But then we also hit the limits of RDS, MySQL. And these two, we have two right now services that are running in front of the uh, database connections to proxy all the incoming database connections to be able to handle the load. Limits, AWS are full of limits. You will hit each and one of them when you are scaling up. Like network limits, maximum jar limits, API gateway 30 seconds, you will, you will find them. Please find them before they find you. And for our future, we want to create actually a data bar. Like we, we didn't use Hadoop to start with, but I think HDFS or Hive or any technology that are built on top of it, they are really valuable. 
And for us, one of the ideas is to take all of our events, for example, and hash all the information and then put it to a location that our data scientists can connect with, the, uh, with their notebooks very easily. Scalable machine learning is a still a global uh, big problem to solve and nobody nailed it very well. There is still a lot of work that needs to be done. Aggregation logs is also a bit harder in CloudWatch. You either need to install your own systems and I don't want to go with the ELK stack to be honest. But also transferring all of your logs to somebody else. Maybe there is a solution to do it with Kinesis and normally indexing in your services. That's also an option. But it's still something that needs to be done. And our next project will be the abstractive summarization. So we go through a lot of stuff and I show you this car. Do you know what this car is, anybody of you? Okay, this is a Porsche Singer. Yeah. This car costs 1.8 million euros. You may think this car was actually, when it began, it was Lisp, but right now it became a closure and it's very valuable. And that is the, I think, the similarity between serverless closure and Porsche because we have all these nice attributes of speed, efficiency, balance, reliability. But when you first look at them, they might be looking ugly, but they are freaking awesome to you. So give the step functions and lambda functions a try. I would like to thank Philip Press's RPO. David Grouse, can you raise your hand? So if you want to talk about AI, go talk with this guy and all the other data sciences that work to make all these services happen because it's a lot of work. I mean, I didn't write a lot of code. If you look at all of our closure code, I don't think it's maybe more than two or 3,000 lines of code. But the amount of brain power they need to build and use to all these services, it is just immense. So I salute them. Thank you very much. like settings uh, problem, complexity problem. Uh. Yeah. So he asked about all the settings and all the linkage, for example, between the services. So since we use the, so we use load balancers on every uh, machine learning solutions. So machines can change behind the scenes, but the load balancer URL is always the same. All we need to do is put this URL to the configuration part. And for the rest of it, of course, it's about restarting your Lambda, for example. If you don't have an auto-reload configuration function inside your code, then you need to restart your Lambda function. So what we do, basically, ship a new version of the jar or just say this is updated, the Lambda will be redeployed with the latest configuration available. But you can basically also implement a reloading function in your code to say you can put an event to a Kinesis, for example, read that event, and whenever that event happens, go read the configuration again. So you can build a system that dynamically updates, updates its configuration. And the rest of it is basically store everything in JSON and then read the JSON because it's a string value you can store. And also one addition thing, you can also use the encryption version of the parameter store as well. So you can store your database credentials that are encrypted behind the scenes, which is a quite nice addition. Great. One more question. So uh, thank you. Um, when I look at the the graph with the step functions, to me semantically it looks equivalent to flow control with the go to statement. Mm -hmm. And then this raises the question: If you put too much logic across step functions, isn't there a risk that you're inflicting extra complexity on yourself because you don't have explicit flow control? That's correct, but I mean, if you don't have the same logic here, you will have the same exact logic in your code. 
which is in my code, maybe in my code, maybe I could use if statements or for loops or no. That's so correct. That's, that's possible. Yeah. You are completely right on this. This is kind of a the limiting factor, right? You basically implement your logic right now here and you cannot see that logic in your code. But I think that's where the tests can be involved that basically uh, link all these functionality together. And at the end of the day, I think it's about a feeling as well, right? What you can do is you can actually call step functions from other step functions. So separate the logic. For example, our transcription process was out of the, the original uh, flow right now. So there is a transcription flow that sits. And then when things fail, we can replay this the transcription uh, step function again. So it's about also uh, splitting the, uh, all the uh, logic and make them simpler, right? I mean, if you look at something and it looks complex, can you make it simpler? If the answer is yes, I think you will find a way to do it also in this UI. Okay, I think we are a bit uh, short on time, so uh, I have to uh, stop taking questions. But uh, Bahadir will be available during the breaks and another time as well, so please uh, poke him for more uh, answers. Definitely. And I'm pretty sure you know what this is. So uh, It's a dieting enjoy. helping tool, I guess. <laughs> And I think the Porsche car is ugly because it looks like unmatched parentheses. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like it looks like a turtle and yeah, a lot of stuff. Yeah. 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 But thanks a lot. Thank um, you very much. Thank you.